You see it everywhere. At least a hundred on your way here. A couple more just rummaging through your purse or man bag. And don't forget the ones you flip through and soiled while on the pot taking a dump. You can't avoid them. The industry feeds off of you. You feed off of it. Before delving into the depths of the field, I deem it important just to emphasize its magnitude. Photography is ubiquitous. It encompasses the lives of everyone and unavoidably so. But just exactly how has it taken its grip? In what ways does it affect you? And do you necessarily care? Logically, the first bit of photo fat to chew on would present itself in defining precisely where subjectivity begins. Although originally conceived as a medium of neutrality in comparison to fine art and craft, how can one claim any form of sight non-personal? Even from the first stages of compositional structure and point of focus, something as seemingly non-objective becomes ridden with meaning. Consider one of the first photos by Niepce, for example. Purely a study of light and exposure. But is that it? When told this was taken from his studio while looking out a window at the courtyard below, instantly meaning changes and personality begins. So does the image become subjective the second it was shot? Or was that created after I just told you what you were looking at? A picture may be worth a thousand words, but who is to say those words are reliable? From the very start, photography has undergone intense scrutiny. I find the debate interesting to start with people's initial wonderment. During its early years, photography was seen as something magical, miraculous, and primitively understood. Around the 1830s, people started associating it with necromancy, calling it phantom photography. According to novelist Honoré de Balzac, all physical bodies are made up entirely of layers of ghost-like images. An infinite number of leaf-like skins laid one on top of another. He concluded that every time someone had his photograph taken, one of the spectral layers was removed from the body and transferred to the photograph. Thus, repeat exposures would not be good for one's health, as they would lose their essence in life. Following this line of skepticism, though, questions of the veracity of photographic treatment remain. Even some of the first images were manually altered. Since over time, photo prints would fade, they would hand paint parts of the images that needed repair. A related example lies within the advent of color. Originally, the black and white prints would be colored in using hand marking instruments. Falling into the realm of fine art and painting, does one even consider it a photograph anymore? Similarly, since capturing people or any mobile mechanism was difficult, photographs were initially restricted to architecture. When looking for a more human touch, photographs could have the people drawn in at a later date. An issue that may be more pertinent to your life as a graphic designer, or any image manipulator for that matter, matter actually has its roots as far back as an artist named Gustave Le Gray, who used double printing as a means of counteracting the bleaching out in some of his photographs. In 1857, Oscar Gustave Raylander took this combination method to the extreme. Composite photography is simply that, combining more than one image to create a new reality. Without layers in Photoshop, this was originally accomplished within the darkroom. Blocking off sections not wished to be exposed and allowing pieces of negatives to mesh took some skill. Thinking back to Raylander's famous Two Ways of Life, or Henry Peach Robinson's Fading Away, the following year, one can begin to notice the put-on nature of these scenes. As many as 30 separate negatives were used during a six-week week pro process for his Two Ways of Life. Robinson justified his work by arguing that the mixing of the real with the artificial was justified if it served a serious, artistic purpose. Some of the first nationally received photos were that from the Civil War. It is important to address this change in public communication and documentation. With people accustomed to traditional illustrations, drawings, and cartoons accompanying printing text, there can be considered a certain language or vernacular when reading its tone, particularly viewing a photograph and graphic illustration of the same scene will not evoke the same visceral emotions. Now, apply this logic to the 1860s. Bloody War. Hired by Matthew Brady, fieldwork photographers such as Timothy O'Sullivan, Alexander Gardner, and John Rickey were sent on battle site lookouts. It was their duty to use the relatively new technology to record the earnestness of war. Newspapers like Harper's Weekly would then inform the people. Never before was it possible for civilians to actually see the damages war does. 
Mr. Brady has done something to bring home to us the reality and earnestness of war, wrote one reporter for the New York Times. For the first time, this brought up the moral issue of decency. Is there a too gory or too emotive when deciding what is appropriate to publish? Should documentary impact be sanctioned? Are photographers playing the game of sensationalism or simply opening the eyes to blunt reality? How would even we go about deciding that? I find it quite interesting to take note of their, their compositions, their careful compositions, so seemingly perfect for such chaos and war. That's because they are too perfect. It was very common that photographers move bodies around with the purpose to get a better picture. The fact that only one face can be seen is not very likely on a battlefield with so many dead soldiers. Why would O'Sullivan turn all the faces away except one? It is a prime example of documentation falling into the hands of exploitation in a given situation. Is it necessary? How does one prof treat Professor Moholy Naj? He was an advocate of the field of photography, and he loved to experiment. Consider figure 16.8 in your text, a type of photo poster for tires. Or 16.10, a photogram or bottle cap of a bottle cap. Even 1611, his satirical photo plastique of quack clacking super geese. The idea behind the photogram has had its origin since the early 1800s with Niepce's experimentation in heliography or sun writing, as well as Talbot stabbling with photogenic drawings. And let's not forget Man Ray's similar experiments with his rayographs. To Moholy Naj, the objects placed on the sensitive paper were were light modulator and no longer identifiable objects. In each of these examples, new environments are generated from select images. Is it unethical to treat an image in this manner? Blatantly, this calls to mind both grammar school art education as well as simple adobe layering and flattening.